cross. And this morning, uh, we're going to be looking at how it deepens our understanding of the Christian journey. And I really want to focus primarily on the wilderness journey uh, of the people of Israel. They had exited out of, uh, out of um, Egypt. And really this morning, as we saw the kids going out, I was thinking about that. So that's a kind of a good reminder of the exodus, right? They just all were going together uh, to the promised land. And for our kids, they were going downstairs for the for springboard. And um, not that this is the world and the springboard is uh, the promised land, but, you know, we saw them going in mass. And that's what Israel got to do, right? Go in mass, leaving Egypt. And so before we really get into this, though, I want to talk about the fact of Old Testament uh, types versus illustrations. And uh, sometimes we can get those things a little bit confused as to, you know, what is an Old Testament type versus an Old Testament illustration? And I want to just touch on that because I think it's important that we have that clear in our mind when we look at the whole issue of um, the, the wilderness journey journey, um, is it a type or is it an illustration for us? And uh, so basically uh, types and uh, versus um, illustrations in the Old Testament. Types in the Old Testament, a type is always identified as such in the New Testament. And so uh, very clearly, it's, it's clearly stated in the New Testament that it is a type. A, a Bible student finding uh, correlations between the Old Testament story and the life of Christ is simply finding illustrations, not types. In other words, typology is determined by Scripture. So the New Testament determines whether or not something in the Old Testament is actually classified or we can call it a type. The, the Holy Spirit inspires, inspired uh, the use of types illustrations and analogies uh, are the result. So the Holy Spirit inspired types, uh, illustrations, analogies are a type, uh, are the result of man's study. For example, many people see the uh, parallels between the story of Joseph and the story of Christ, his humiliation and then his subsequent glorification. And of course, Joseph went through a lot of pain and suffering as Christ went through a lot of pain and suffering. However, the New Testament never uses Joseph as a model of Christ. So at no point in time will you find in the New Testament where Joseph is referred to as a type of Christ. Therefore, we cannot call him a type of Christ. We can say it is an illustration, and there's lots of similarities there, but we need to be careful about calling him a type. On the other hand, the whole sacrificial system of the Old Testament is seen as a type, and you find that in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 19 through 26. The Passover is also a type of Christ, according to 1 Corinthians. Corinthians 5 verse 7. And so we have types and they're very clearly stated in the New Testament. Illustrations are like types. They really are. Because you can see a lot of the similarities. Again, you look at the life of Joseph and there's a lot of similarities to Joseph's life and what Christ went through. And so the wilderness journey is uh, an illustration, not a type. Now, parts of the wilderness journey, in fact, are a type. And that's where it can sometimes get a little confusing with types versus illustrations. Uh, for instance, the snake in the wilderness is a type of Christ. And we know that because John chapter 3, verse 14, Christ declares that. We know that the rock, of course, is a type of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4, we just read that. We can also learn, of course, a lot from these illustrations, but we need to be careful about not making more of them than we ought to. And so when we're looking at this particular, the wilderness journey, we want to be careful about not making more of it than we should. Um, but there's lots that we can learn from it. So what does the wilderness journey illustrate about the Christian walk for us today? Does the wilderness journey matter to us? And so there are some people who would say, well, the wilderness journey of Israel, you know, as spelled out in numbers, really is not that important to us. I mean, let's face it, it's just a bunch of records of where they camped and how long they stayed, and then they pulled up their tents and they moved again, and, they, you know, they constantly on the go, and there's all that. However, there are many key principles, though, that are revealed in this account uh, that provide application of truth for our lives today. 
In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 12, focuses on the travel, and that's what we just read, focuses on the travel of the Israelites, and it says twice that those are done or written for us as an example for us. So they're an example for us, something that we can learn from that. So I don't know when's the last time you went through, you know, Exodus and Numbers and read through and, and, and said, okay, teach me, Lord, from this. Um, some examples and some principles that I can apply to my life. And we need to be careful with it. But if we handle it carefully, there are some great principles that we can apply. There is the important principle of making God the center focus of all of life. That was a reality for them as they were wandering through the wilderness. In our world, religion or spirituality is often seen as one aspect of life. And so it's one little component. We, we, we have a, a huge component of, of our society that makes Sunday morning, that's it. You know, you come to church on Sunday morning, you've quote-unquote done your Christian deed. And, um, and, and that's pretty much it. Or, or you might have your, your devotion in the morning, but then the rest of the day, you're just living your life. And, um, and, and we, we have a tendency to separate our spirituality from every day and every aspect of life, when in reality, it should be part of every aspect of our life. The wilderness journey reveals, of course, God's role in every aspect of life, from the very food we eat, to where we sleep, to how um, we interact with others, and how we worship God. The wilderness travels of the Israelites also provided good examples of God at work in the everyday situations of life. You know, we see, of course, God providing daily for them food. And, and of course, God had very specifically laid out for them, right? Exactly what they were to do. They were supposed to take a certain amount for each person that they had in their home. And, and no more than that. They'd take the right amount and they would have it for that day. And they weren't to save any for tomorrow because what would they do? If they saved some for tomorrow, what were they saying to God? Was well, simply, God, I don't trust that tomorrow you're going to provide for me. And so in their not trusting God, you know, there was a very clear dem demonstration that they did not trust that God was going to provide. How many times do we do that? We say, God, I don't I trust you. I'm not, I'm not sure that I can trust that you're going to provide for me in this situation. So they needed to learn to daily trust God. And of course, if they took too much and they saved it, the next morning it was full of worms and it stank. But on the seventh day, so sorry, on the sixth day, they were to take up enough for two days. And on the seventh day, there was not going to be any. And yet, you know what they did? <laughs> there were some who went out on the seventh day looking for manna. And God got angry with them. Why? Because again, they weren't trusting God. God said, I will provide on the sixth day enough for you for the seventh day because the seventh day is a day of rest. So we learn about God's provision. God also uh, pr uh, provides them with water from the rock. And of course, that's a beautiful picture, and we have that here in verse 4. And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which, w which followed them, and the rock was Christ. And you can get into all kinds of discussions about that, and we're not going to do that this morning. But the point is that God provided for them. God provided for them the water that they needed and what are the two things that we need more than anything else? We need bread and we need water, right? We need to have sustenance. We need to have that which will carry us through. The ability then, of course, as well to overcome um, the enemies. You know, we see that through this story, that they were able to overcome their enemies time and time and time again. In fact, in the one case where, you know, we, Achan had... had stolen and, and hidden stuff away in his tent and uh, what was the response? They lost 34 people and they were devastated because they would go to war and God would provide them victory over their enemies without any casualties on their side. That teaches us about the enemies that we face and we all face different enemies and whatever it is that we're facing, we can trust and know that God has power and we can turn to him and from him receive the power to overcome those enemies. And I'm not talking people here. I'm talking about situations, struggles that you are going through. 
And the Lord is there to give us that which we need to help us through. How the Israelites camped helps us also to reveal the importance of community. You know, they, they, they camped together. You know, and again, that illustration of the children all going together. You know, and, and that's significant of, you know, the, the spiritual reality for us. In contrast uh, with the popular rise today of individual, individualized spirituality and this idea that I can live my Christian life on my own and I don't need to be in community and I don't need to be in communion with the body of Christ, this teaches us, no, that's not true. We need the body. Israel, Israel worshipped at the tabernacle together. They celebrated the Passover and other holy days together. They, they operated daily in community. And that is such a great reminder for us as a church continually that we need each other. We need each other. We need that community. And that community goes beyond Sunday mornings. And I'm, I'm so thankful for the reality that here at Lansing, that is a reality. That people are getting together, not just Sunday mornings, not just in small group Bible studies, but just getting together to, to go for a coffee or to have each other over for lunch and just connecting with each other. And that is vitally important for the body of Christ. To be in community together. The way the Israelites traveled reveals our total dependence on God. He led them in a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, how does God lead us today? Last time I looked, there was no cloud leading me. There was no pillar of fight, fire leading me. God leads me predominantly through the Word of God. By being in the Word of God and allowing the Word of God to speak to me daily, continually. You want to be led by the Word of God? Be in the Word of God. You want to be led by God? Read His Word. Continually seeking Him. Continually seeking for His direction. You know, and, and, and I get, you know, there are those who would say, well, God speaks to us directly. I have a song that I play. Um, it's called "Smell the Color." Smell, smell the number nine, and um, yeah, something like that. Anyways, by Chris Rice, and it's it's just is a really catchy tune. But but the song is all about the fact that God gives messages to everybody, but but He has not yet ever heard from God, and He wished that He would just hear from God. A no, just just a no, that God would just audibly say no to him. Then at least he would know that he heard from God. And and the point is is that um, if if you want to hear from God, predominantly it's through the Word of God. Can God lay something upon someone's heart? Absolutely. Can God speak to us through other people? Absolutely. But if you're expecting God to speak to you audibly, I believe that you're going to wait for a long time. Because I believe that God has chosen to speak to us through his word. In the Old Testament, he led through a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. In the New Testament, he leads us through the word of God. The tabernacle was a place of worship, a place that was placed in the center of the people of God. And again, that is very important for us as well to recognize that the tabernacle, the place of worship, needs to be center of our life. It's not something that we just do once in a while. We should spontaneously, naturally, as things come up, praise God. We should spontaneously, naturally, as things come up, call out to God. You don't have to wait till your morning devotion to praise God. You don't have to wait until you, just before you go to bed to talk to God. You can do it at any point in time throughout the day. Have those special moments, but any time during the day, we have the privilege. And so the tabernacle in the center of God's people reminds us of the fact that that is the very place where it needs to be in our lives. And the fact that Israel, you know, God had, had determined that an entire tribe was going to be set apart to make sure that worship happened. It tells us how important it is. How important. And worship was not a thing that was done once a week. You know, I, I've had this 
talk, and, and, and you, if you've been around here long enough, you know that I don't believe that the Sabbath day was predominantly a day of worship. It was a day of rest. Not predominantly a day of worship. We've made it that in Christianity. But that's not what it predominantly was. Not in the Old Testament. It was a day of rest. Because they worshipped every day. They didn't just worship on the Sabbath day. Now they also worshipped on the Sabbath day. And I get the fact that since they weren't working on the Sabbath day, maybe that became a concentrated time in which they could do it. And legalists would have come in and said, ah, that's the day. But that was never the intent of God. It was a day of rest. But worship was to be every day. Continually. Throughout the day. And that's a great reminder for us. It was not a one day thing. It was a continual thing. They were constantly worshipping God as we ought to constantly worship God. In their travels through the wilderness, the Israelites experienced many special works of God to provide for their needs and direct their hearts toward God. And again, we have the Word of God. And, and we don't need supernatural events to cause us to follow after God. We need the Word of God. We need to be in the Word of God. And yet when we read concerning what God has done in Numbers and what we read what God has done supernaturally for the people of Israel, that ought to encourage us to recognize that we can trust him in every situation, in every aspect. And I believe God is still a God of miracles. And I believe that God can still heal people. And I believe that God can still um, you know, cause all kinds of miracles to happen within our world. But I want you to understand that if you're looking for miracles as a confirmation of your faith, chances are you will fail. Because the reality is, more often than not, people get sick and they die. And if your faith is based on them getting better, I just spent a week talking about my, my second book that I just finished on can a God of love will suffering in our life. And uh, so I just spent a week on that at Galilean talking to mostly 75-year-old people who all experienced suffering, who all understood and, and recognized the realities of that in life. More often than not, we pray for God to heal someone. We pray for God to fix what we want the way we want it. And the answer is no. And the person dies. My concluding topic was, can you serve a God who hurts you? And I think a lot of times Christians, we don't want to serve a God who can hurt us. But here we have this reality that we see that yes, God does supernatural things, but if you are living for the supernatural, then the question is, what God are you really serving? A God who's going to give you what you want, or the God of the Word of God? And in the wilderness, although they saw some supernatural things, they also went through a lot of very difficult things. The wilderness journey reminds us, of course, that we're living in tents. If you have your Bibles, again, flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're living in tents. Verses 1 to 8. For, for we know that the earthly tent which is our house, is torn down. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is um, mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave, uh, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. The wilderness journey reminds us that we're living in tents. 
Paul tells us that again here, you know, we're living in tents. This is not our permanent place. You know, it's very significant for us as Christians to recognize that we um, live in something that one day we're going to leave behind. This tent living is at times burdensome. You know, when you think again about the uh, journey that the Israelites were taking, they were never settled. They were on a journey. They left Egypt. We left the world. They looked for the promised land, and so do we. We're going to talk about the promised land next week, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that today. But they're looking for the promised land, and so are we. They could not put down their roots. There was a steady progression towards the promised land. We are also progressing. We're progressing towards the promised land. Physically, we're pro progressing towards the, or the promised land. In a simple nature, the fact that as we get older, more and more every day, we are a day closer to going to glory. Every day, we're getting closer to what Paul says, being unclothed from this tent and putting on our heavenly house. But there's also a spiritual progression. And in many ways, the the uh, wilderness journey is an illustration of what it took for God to uh, cause his people to mature and to grow spiritually. And that is true for us. This journey that we're on, having left Egypt, the world, and on our way to the promised land, heaven, and we're working towards that, and we're on our way there, but we're in that situation right now. We're on a journey, and we need to grow and mature in Christ, and we're continually stepping one step closer closer. We need to be progressing physically, we are, and spiritually we need to be progressing continually. The wilderness journey reminds us that we have not yet arrived. They left Egypt. Now in the mind of the Jewish people in Moses' day, they would have expected, because it wasn't a long journey, to get from Egypt to get to the promised land, just a few days. And they should have been there. But it took 40 years. Why did it take 40 years? The reality was because the people that left Egypt were not yet prepared for the promised land. There was a time frame in which they needed to be developed and grow. Philippians chapter 3. Again, just flip over there with me. Philippians chapter 3. Verses um, 8 through 14, the Apostle Paul describes that. He says, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowledge, than of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count, uh, count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which, co which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death in order that I may obtain may attain to the resurrection from the dead not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus the wilderness journey reminds us that we've not yet arrived. Paul understood the, the reality and the importance of pressing on. He did not rely on his past. Verse 8, it is foolish to think that because at some point in time you believed that that means everything's good. That means everything's good. You know, we live in a, in a Christian world where the concept is that as long as you pray to prayer, and, and, and some of us, and, 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 and I, I hate to say this, but, but some of us have children who have prayed a prayer, and we have this notion that they're okay with God because they prayed a prayer even though they're living for the devil. And the reality is, they're not. They're not okay. 
And you, if you're here this morning and you prayed a prayer sometime way back when and you came forward and you, you, you came to the altar and we, we, last night if you were here, the gentleman talked about coming to the altar. It's, it's, that's perfectly okay to do that. But I'm telling you, if you come to the altar and that's where it ends, that's where it ends. That's it. It doesn't go any further. Because that's not salvation. That's a profession of faith. And we need to be clear on that. Paul understood that. The question is, what do you believe today? Do you believe it today? Is your faith impacting you today? I've shared from my own life many times. You know, at the age of eight, I received Christ as my Savior in my backyard. We had a child evangelism fellowship uh, missionary come and teach our yes, our five day club in my backyard, in, at my own home. And the last day, my brother and I both we went forward and and we prayed the sinner's prayer. And and in a couple months later, we got baptized in the church. And 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 that was all wonderful, right? And that was. But when I was 14, I had to ask myself the question, do I really believe this? And when I was 21, I had to revisit it again. Why do I believe this above everything else? And I had to come to the question of, is this real in my life? Is it affecting me today? Because just because I prayed a prayer when I was 8 years old did not mean I automatically got a go, you know, uh, a ticket to go to heaven. It was the importance and the significance of daily, continual pursuing the things of God. Paul was never satisfied. Verse 9. He was never satisfied. Too many times we want to get into heaven by the skin of our teeth. I mean, the amount of times that I've had people ask me, so, so what can I get away with? <laughs> what? What can I get away with? If that's your Christian attitude, get on your knees before God. Because the reality is, chances are, you're not saved. Because that is not the attitude of a child of God. What can I get away with? How much sin can I be involved with and still go to heaven? We're to be striving towards purity and holiness before God. Paul wants the true righteousness that comes from knowing Christ. From knowing Christ. Paul wants righteousness that comes through faith, not through works. Not by how good I am, not by you know, how little I sin or, or how much I give or whatever it is. It is all because I've got faith in Jesus Christ. He wanted to know the Lord's power in his life. Verses 10 through 11, he speaks about that. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. Paul wanted to know the power of Christ in suffering. This is significant. Knowing the power of Christ, again, a lot of times in our North American concept of knowing the power of Christ, we want it to be from success to success. But what about knowing the power of Christ in suffering, in the fellowship of his suffering? Paul was after genuine faith, the kind that did not run as soon as hard times came his way. There are many people who profess faith in Christ. And when tough times come, and they will come, they run. They run. That's not real faith. And don't think they were saved and lost it. (laughs) They were never saved. How do we know that? Because a genuine child of God is someone who will persevere to the end. They'll persevere to the end. That's the faith that will allow us to attain to the resurrection. 
He was not resting in a false assurance. And I think this is significant in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained it, or uh, I have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may not lay hold, so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ. And then verse 13, brethren, I do not want, do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Paul was not satisfied to say, I'm okay. As Christians, we should never be satisfied with our Christian walk. I served one time with a guy who was in his 90s. He'd done everything he could possibly think of doing in the church. And he talked about the fact that he was, he was terrified that when he stood before God, that God would say, you didn't do enough. He didn't do enough. And this man was sold out for God. Sold out for God. And he wasn't afraid that he was going to lose his salvation. He was just afraid that he hadn't served God well enough. And I believe that's the point that Paul is making here, is that I want to serve God to the very best, to the very best, to the very best of my ability, by the grace and the mercy of God. And this concept that we have in Canada and in North America where we can serve God half-heartedly and quote-unquote still be okay, that's contrary to anything that Paul teaches and anything that the scriptures teach. Paul was committed to continue to strive for the faith. He was committed to endure to the end. And I just want to pause here and say, if you're someone who is, has reached retirement, I'm trying not to look at any of you retired people right now, because I don't want to single any one of you out. Retirement from a job sets you free to serve God full time. Because you've got a paycheck now. Don't squander it. Don't squander it. And that doesn't mean you have to be preaching. It doesn't mean you have to be at the church all the time. But serve him full time. Find ways to make your time valuable for the kingdom of God. And if you're already doing that, I know some of you are. Praise God. Continue on. Paul kept moving forward. Verse 14. I press on toward the goal for a prize of the upward call of God in Christ. Press on. Press on. We cannot become complacent on our journey. Just like the Israelites had to press on, so must we. Our journey is not done and will not be over until we get to the promised land. And our promised land is not retirement. Our promised land is not 55 our promised land is not when we get our mortgage paid off. Our promised land is not when we get all of the things that we want in this world. Our promised land is glory. And so we do not end, we do not stop until we get to that place. The wilderness journey reminds us of our daily reliance on the Lord. Jesus teaches us this as well. Matthew chapter 6 verse 11, Give us this day our daily bread. God provide, ma provided manna daily. Every day we rely on the Lord for everything we have. Every day we rely on God for our spiritual nourishment. God provided water. Christ is the living water that springs up within us and refreshes us. As I conclude, sometimes we can forget that we are on a journey. And we can forget that every day we need to, the Lord to sustain us. We can get that way. When we think that we can sustain ourselves, we can do this. I can take care of myself. Studying the wilderness journey of the Israelites help, helps uh, to bring perspective to our reality that we were called out of Egypt as, as we are called out of the world, that they spend a lifetime journeying towards the promised land as we are on a lifelong journey to the promised land. They could not quit, and we must not quit either. We are to press on toward the goal of the upward call. Maybe you're here this morning, and you can't honestly say that you have come 
out of the world. You've not yet come out of the world. You don't know what it means to have Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You don't know what it means to have come out of the world. Don't leave today before you talk to someone and say, what does that mean? How do, how do I get to that place of coming out of the world? Maybe you're on a journey. But like the Israelites, you are looking back and wishing that you were back in the world. You know, when you look at the, the Israelites in the journey, and I am concluding here, so I'm not going to pick it, ramp it up, but as you think about them, they were constantly looking back. But how many of us Christians do the same thing? We long to go back to the things that we used to do, things that were dishonoring to the Lord. I want to encourage you, don't give up. Press on. Press on. And if you are here this morning and you know that you're on the journey and at times it has been hard, but you are pressing on, may the Lord bless you and keep you and keep your eyes on the prize. Let's pray. Lord, we just come and we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that you've put that account of Exodus and, and Numbers in your scriptures and it's not there to waste space. It's there to teach us about the journey we're on. And may we not lose sight of the fact that we're on a journey. This is not our home. We have a home in glory. And I pray that we would not forget that. In Jesus' name, amen.